Well, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining today. Uh, this talk is recorded, and we plan to post it on uh, YouTube and Spotify. Uh, so I'll just uh, introduce uh, BAF. Uh, we have a 5123 nonprofit that aims to accelerate uh, blockchain education and awareness. Uh, and this year, we try to work, especially with club, to uh, help them uh, source speakers, source sponsors, give them free tickets, and try to engage more students into the, the blockchain space. Uh, and we try to uh, do some educational meetups like this one. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for being here on Sun It. Like, uh, you, you feel free to, to, to take the talk and ask any question. Sure, yeah, happy to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sunit. I'm the head of community at Dartmouth Blockchain, currently a senior at Dartmouth, major in computer science and economics. Um, yeah, you know, it's a pleasure to be here and be with you all today. Um, definitely, you know, happy to, excited to be part of this. And uh, yeah, we'll kind of go through in terms of the agenda today, just a bit of an introduction, um, you know, hear more about your background, um, then move into kind of the macro landscape, some of the top trends, you know, what, you know, in terms of market cycles, what's going on there. Um, and then sort of shift into what do we think the themes are, um, and then kind of go into some Q&A and things like that. So that's broadly what we'll go into. Um, but we'll let the discussion take us as it goes as well. I'll, I'll do a quick introduction. So um, I'm very uh, looking forward to, you know, getting some more exposure to, I guess, uh, uh, students uh, interested in uh, crypto side of stuff. So uh, I've been, uh, you know, I've been deliberately, I guess, uh, reaching out and also uh, having uh, seeking opportunities to get more exposure to different uh, student bodies across the uh, across the US who are interested in uh, getting into crypto, and uh, you know uh, that that's why I also uh, presented myself here and to to kind of like uh, share uh, some some of my uh, uh, thoughts uh, here at uh, with, with uh, Buff uh, this time. And uh, I'm I'm Yuki, and uh, I'm also a, a researcher and an investor at uh, Fabushi. Uh, capital and uh, a, a little bit about uh, Fibushi. Uh, we are a crypto native venture capital firms founded uh, back in 2015, and uh, uh, we have been investing in this space uh, for for a while. For a while, but uh, uh, we have had a, quite a focus around the uh, infrastructure uh, uh, space, whether it be on a on a privacy or or on a uh, MEV or or just general consensus infrastructures, uh, we have been kind of uh, supporting uh, quite quite a lot of those uh, projects in the in that sector in the space uh, as well. And uh, yeah, we are really looking forward to seeing more interesting stuff coming out of the student bodies uh, across uh, across the US and beyond. Certainly, yeah, I appreciate the introduction. Um, but let's kind of hear a little bit more about your background. So you mentioned. Um, you know, for example, like Finbushi, it's like Asia-focused VC fund. Um, and in terms of your background, we saw that you attended the University of Chicago, studied computer science um, as well as chemistry and kind of, you know, did sort of in that sort of biology area for a while. Um, and then went on the co-founding and startup route before joining Finbushi. Um, well, let's kind of hear, you know, why you joined crypto, what you sort of learned along that journey, um, and why you thought it was both the right fit for you as well as the right time to move from the startup world into the investing side. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great question. So, um, I think uh, uh, as you as you mentioned, yes, we I did start off with uh, uh, a lot of like uh, uh, I guess projects building background. So I did uh, um, I built I think my first venture started off uh, back in uh, um, back in I guess it was like even before my college era, where I was basically like building like online education platform, uh, uh, which uh kind of uh took off and uh went uh very well uh it was a very good like uh, uh business uh and then it's actually still still running and they're they're currently raising capital <laughs> capital right now <laughs> um so so you know it's it's a it's a very traditional business uh that isn't necessarily like web 2 or even web 3 um but uh, it was a, it was a very super super exciting stuff and I've, I've i've got to learn a lot from that experience uh building that venture as well um so so that was that and then and then afterwards, I kind of like ventured into like Web2 space where I was like, OK, you know, the social network kind of stuff is like is, is emerging and I wanted to like have a have a bite of that. Uh, so I doubled with the social network concepts uh, for the ventures that I was experimenting with. 
um, which, uh, you know, didn't work as well as the first ventures. So, you know, I kind of like quitted that one and then later on got into uh, crypto uh, and, and more in general, the Web3 space. Um, and, and that's where I kind of like uh, really got religiously uh, sort of uh, into the, uh, uh, let's say, the per permissionless and the trustless aspect of uh, what, what blockchain enables. And, uh, and that's kind of like where I... Uh, first started off like building uh, smaller uh, applications uh, on, a, on a data side of stuff, which later on got merged and then uh, started exploring more investment stuff, uh, which uh, is what also led me to, uh, you know, do uh, investments uh, with uh, Fibushi Capital, which uh, kind of runs like, a, uh, runs like a collective to some extent. So people... Uh, at Fibushi comes from a, a various different backgrounds. Maybe some of them are even like building their own venture on their own, you know, uh, but but they also participate as Fibushi as one of the investor uh, as we kind of like see ourselves as a collectively collectively run uh, venture capital fund uh, to some extent. So so that's why uh, I'm uh, also, uh, you know, participating and investing uh, with uh, Fibushi Capital. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, well, it sounds like super interesting. And, uh, you know, definitely a jack of all trades, <laughs> still having the successful startups that are fundraising. That's obviously great to hear as well. Um, so kind of moving into that, you know, mindset that you have both startup experience as well as investing experience. Um, curious to hear sort of what your thoughts is and the thesis on having the peanut butter like an Asia focused fund. Um, you know, I understand that Finbushi is pretty sector or geographic agnostic, investing across the four major continents. Um, but, you know, curious, there seems to be this big push in crypto right now where whether it's, you know, funding um, or it's AUM or any sort of other, you know, key metrics and KPIs, um, there's a big push towards Asia and specifically East Asia as kind of being the sort of hotbed and center of activity. Um, part of this could be due towards, you know, government regulation and this push in the United States sort of against crypto right now, uh, but also for other reasons as well. So we'd love to kind of hear in your eyes. Um, why being part of a VC fund in Asia specific, you know, how that might be different for people who aren't sort of familiar with that. Um, and if there's any differences you see in like the fundraising process or investment or due diligence um, and kind of how that interaction happens, especially since you're investing pretty, you know, geographic agnostic. Right, right, right. So in terms of like the, uh, as you mentioned, like the key metrics, uh, at least for uh, Fembushi side, uh, we are running at uh, around a 1.5 billion uh, fund uh, that uh, uh, we are investing out of. And uh, in terms of the uh, sort of like the uh, perspectives that we see from the Asia perspective, like a from Asia side, I think uh, uh, one interesting aspect that I, I guess I can raise here is that uh, uh, we 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 see a lot of uh, uh, whether it be a regulatory side of stuff or or sort of like the market uh, structure side of stuff. Uh, quite differently from a lot of the uh, perhaps like U.S. Uh, native uh, venture capital firms. I think um, uh, being non-U.S. actually puts you in a position where you could be a lot more flexible uh, in terms of how you first uh, see the market uh, and, 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 and second, how you see sort of like the regulatory aspect of it. Um, I think one good example is to think about like, okay, you know, um, they're happy uh, a uh, 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 sort of like a, a, a rising narrative around like how some of the uh, U.S.-based investors kind of dislike a lot of the privacy infrastructure uh, just because of the, you know, um, I guess stigma that uh, uh, the government has uh, uh, raised uh, around like, oh, privacy infrastructure is, uh, is, is perhaps like, you know, uh, it's going to be uh, regulated in some way or the other, or like perhaps it's it's even going to be like uh, you know uh, not not going to be appealing uh, as an infrastructure for a lot of the U.S. users, etc. And, and so so that kind of stuff I hear quite a lot from like the, the U.S. based investor. But frankly, from my perspective or from our perspective, you know, given that we see the market a quite a lot more wider than the the just the U.S. side of things, uh, we can be, make uh, a lot more. I guess, uh, in some way, uh, 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 aggressive, but perhaps uh, regulatory, a bit more risky bet in terms of like, you know, investing in projects that may have some, you know, barriers uh, of entry in the US, but may not, but, but doesn't have that sort of like a similar stuff elsewhere. And we will still continue to invest because it makes sense for the rest of the, uh, the crypto space. And then I think one 
another another side of things that I would I would I would just add is that I think um the actual usage of crypto in my opinion has been a lot more um active and and and, and broader uh outside of the uh, US so uh if you look at Latin America if you look at Africa um you know those are those are areas where uh, crypto is really like uh you know meeting the product market fit uh, a lot of people are actually even relying on it for daily usage, which is something that we haven't yet seen a lot within uh, U.S. Given that the U.S. dollar is such a strong currency to start with, um, so 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 coming from that side, I feel like you know, um, it, 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 from my perspective, it, it's super important that we have a a, a very uh, uh, sort of like a wide global perspective about the usage of crypto instead of getting um, sort of like. Uh, you know, uh, anchored down in the specific like regulatory uh, uh, ju- jurisdiction, uh, ju- jurisdiction like like USA, for example. Right. I think you bring up a lot of interesting points. So uh, both in terms of the fact that you're able to make more sort of riskier or at least more aggressive plays in terms of the infrastructure and the hosting and things like that, as you know, the restrictions that the United States is currently placing is not as prevalent. And on top of that, in you know, in places like parts of Europe in Africa and even South America, crypto is becoming sort of that foundational payment system where they already rely on sort of, you know, Venmo equivalents and other private vendors um, and financial institutions to facilitate payments. Um, but they sort of have an additional use case and as well as like an additional reliance on crypto that perhaps hasn't really been embedded um, to the level, same level in the West so far. So kind of continuing on that line, um, we'd love to hear sort of what you think the macro landscape looks like. You mentioned, you know, some sort of trends you think are good bets for you guys or at least have like interesting areas of appeal um are there sort of common red flags or green flags when sort of doing your research and due diligence um that come up and how have those changed recently with you know going from a bull market to a bear market with recent changes and some of the larger players um so we'd love to kind of hear like how your sort of investment theses have changed over the past couple of months or even for Fundushi since you know um it's been here for several years now, almost eight years at this point in time, um, over time as well. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing that uh, we kind of uh, uh, like to stick with uh, within this very like, you know, uh, you know, turmoil uh, market uh, situation is to uh, stick with the uh, fundamentals. So uh, something that I, th- I think Fabrishiki has been pretty good at or at least from my perspective that we are pretty good at is not to get swallowed into uh the sort of like the hype and uh, and the narrative i believe uh we have always uh maintained a fairly a fairly contrarian uh perspectives among the investors in the space May- maybe not the most like you know um so like the <laughs> Uh, like uh, not not the kind of person that may win the popularity contest, but we definitely would win in terms of like what kind of fundamentals that we stick with for our investment thesis. So uh, in that sense, like for example, uh, some of the things that we continue to uh, look at for investment is one um, uh, uh, infrastructure middlewares that are building a uh, trust minimized on uh, building on top of like trust minimized solutions. Um, so so for example, uh, likes of Oracle. Uh, and, and bridges that uh, uh, that are already big and 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 uh, running uh, up and running in the space uh, are perhaps not yet uh, even uh, permissionless uh, as a as a network, um, like uh, or, or even perhaps that the that the network is not sustainably uh, profitable given the the way that uh, it is it is structured. Uh, I think one uh, interesting uh, example to take is. Is likes of a uh, Chainlink, where they have the Chainlink uh, 2.0 upgrade, uh, where uh, they have tried or they have attempted to address the exact uh, issues around like how they can make the Chainlink network be more permissionless. Uh, but uh, but frankly, I think it's a it's a very tough uh, tough proposition that they're tackling with with their existing sort of like a crypto economic security model. And uh, and frankly, I'm looking forward to seeing more interesting. Uh, uh, middlewares that are built on top of like trust minimized solutions, so that uh, that uh, you know each each uh, each infrastructure middleware don't have to go through the same troubles that uh, uh, likes of Chainlink is going through, uh, and and that applies to like you know bridges uh, as well. Um, so 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 those are some some areas. Another ones could be uh, like a privacy infrastructure. So, um, so I, I see I see there's a Andrew Andrew from uh, Zcash here, <laughs> and uh, you know I think. Uh, 
uh, he, he's a he's a big advocate for a lot of the pro programmable privacy uh, enabled by a lot of the ESGX side of things. And uh, frankly, we have been also investing a lot of those uh, infrastructure over the past uh, years as as we believe that the privacy is uh, is is almost like a basic uh, rights that uh, we we should have uh, on chain um and and i think uh, uh you know our perspective on that hasn't been really swayed by any sort of regulatory turmoil around like the the tornado cash incidents or etc uh we always believe that uh, it, it should exist as a as a basic uh, option for anyone who is performing transactions on chain um, so, so yeah, those are just uh, some examples of uh, things that we, uh, at, ex at its core, uh, stick with for our, our investments. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. And I can totally understand from a sort of longitudinal perspective, um, not just sort of going to specific trends, but actually looking at, you know, what, what are use cases that are going to stick around for a while? And what are the value propositions that might actually be maximized over time and facilitate uh, more, you know, it's efficacious use of protocols is definitely valuable, like middleware, for example, you mentioned. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, since this is, you know, heavily like college blockchain focused, um, you know, a couple of our co-hosts here are running our college blockchain clubs. Um, a lot of people in college blockchain clubs right now are curious of sort of how to break in. And in terms of like development space and those on the technical side, they have somewhat of an understanding that's a bit more accessible, whereas something like crypto VC is generally, I would say, on average, probably more inaccessible due to just lesser number of roles as well as generally acquiring more experience. Um, there's, of course, you know, a multitude of paths to sort of break in and get that exposure. A lot of people might go into TradFi and do, you know, financial services for a couple of years and then break into VC and then crypto VC. Um, people such as yourselves might go on the, you know, become an operator and then break in. I'm curious, you know, obviously it's a different situation for everybody, but your sort of advice and learnings from how you think it's best to navigate that path, some insights into how to navigate the decision of for, you know, college age blockchain enthusiasts or just young adults in general, how to kind of go through that. And your sort of insights about how breaking into crypto VC might be different than TradFi or VC in general. Uh, and yeah, we just kind of hear your takes and any insights you have on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually think that uh, um, breaking to, let's say, at least on the VC side of things within crypto is actually quite, um, um, I guess, you, you can you can go through a very like, uh, a, a many, many different ways, right? Um, I think I think there are a lot of optionalities in terms of how you can approach it. Some people may prefer to go with the more sort of like personable uh, route, where I believe uh, I believe Miko from uh, Gumi, Gumi Crypto has uh, tweeted once uh, a while back where he was saying like how uh, you know if you want to get into crypto VC or like the more on the investment side, you know you just want to be like sending him se sending him deals, <laughs> sending him projects that uh, <laughs> is investable. And uh, you know, if if you like what you what 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 uh, what you're sending, then the then he will consider you as uh, as part of the team, right? Uh, so that's one way, right? And obviously another way is to uh, to to build your own projects and then uh, maybe exit or uh, or continue building while you also participate in the investing side of things, which is also another possibility. And then lastly, you just sort of heads on send a bunch of applications to a bunch of like VCs and kind of like I guess go the hard way, uh, which which is also fine. Uh, I think uh, either either way it works. Uh, I just think that. Um, I don't think there is one recipe that uh, sort of fits all uh, into how how you get into VC, uh, and, uh, and 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 yeah, it's it's definitely a, a fun space to explore for anyone who's interested. Certainly, yeah, that makes sense. It's obviously, like you mentioned, there's a number of different paths, um, and definitely, it's, I'd say you know welcoming to hear that it's not as difficult to break in as perhaps uh, you know initially made out to be. Um, I think it's also an interesting point to bring up a deal flow. I think, you know, one of the things about crypto, especially in blockchain clubs and these sort of, you know, being closer to the heart of these entrepreneurial ecosystems is your ability to access deal flow. These emerging startups um, can even be greater in some cases than people who might not have that sort of opportunity. And so, you know, sort of embedding yourself in the deal flow and connecting VCs who might be good fits for those companies or those startups is an interesting way in. Um, so sort of appreciate your insights on that. Um, kind of last thing before I'll turn it over um, to their co-host. Um, in terms of ETH Denver, so, you know, you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, getting a little bit sick there during that. 
Um, but a lot of people are at East Denver and it was, you know, just happened for, for those of you who may not be familiar, just happened sort of this past weekend um, was the primary conference and sort of the hackathons and the hacker houses and some of the more uh, other events that have been going on for the past approximately two-ish weeks. What I'll hear from sort of your attendance um, and your experience is there, you know, what kind of insights came out of that? Are there any major narrative or investment thesis changes that have come to you? Um, any sort of golden nuggets and just kind of being in that space, um, what sort of thoughts came out and how has your perspective shifted after the event? Yeah, so I think there are a few narratives that are popping in this space. Uh, I think one of them, I probably don't have to even like mention much. It's it's definitely the, the sheer security, the eigenlayer, the Babylon, Babylon chain set of stuff, right? Everyone kind of been talking about it for the past many, many months uh, already. So so that's that's that. I think uh, another narrative uh, right now I, I see is the, the raw app thesis where people have been kind of uh, uh, claiming that uh, uh, raw app uh, is going to be a thing uh, after all of the modular stack uh, on uh, Celestia, on Eigen DA uh, with uh, a bunch of different uh, DA, uh, a bunch of different VM provided by uh, Risk Zero and uh, and a few networks, etc., is ready for people to start adopt and build. Uh, and and so so that kind of narrative is also spinning up uh, quite aggressively right now, with especially with the advent of uh, a lot of the roll up SDK uh, provided by likes of uh, Eclipse, uh, Sorry Labs, and uh, Constellation Labs, or or they changed the name to Caldera recently, and uh, and and many more uh, uh, of, of of those similar SDK type of projects. Um, so so that's another big narrative. And then I think an, another one that uh, I see is like a lot of projects. I think the zk still has a very big momentum. Um, I believe uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, was it was a Stellar Network. Um, I think I think I saw Mo from Center Network. But anyway, I, th I think uh, Center Network uh, uh, recently published was it like today or yesterday published a uh, uh, zk benchmark uh, report, which I thought was uh, super interesting. Uh, so so if anyone is uh, interested, it should 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 definitely take a look at that. Um, and but 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 yeah, I think uh, the zk narrative is still very strong. Uh, perhaps a bit more emerging one is like a, a talk around zkml. Um, people are kind of experimenting how ZKML could be a, a thing in, in crypto or perhaps even outside of crypto. Um, something that I guess I, <laughs> yeah, I realized uh, um, in this in this uh, space and on, and on this uh, entire Denver um, um, trip is that uh, I didn't realize that the MEV was such a contrarian um, thing, uh, as in, um, I, so so I do a lot of research around like MEV side of stuff and uh, um, and I I was it was until like you know uh, more and more people I talked with that I realized that uh, uh, perhaps MEV is still seem seemed a bit like contrary as a thesis uh, that we hold uh, for a lot of the investments and the research involvements that we have um, so so that's something that you know was was quite interesting but but having said that you know uh, we. We did about uh, about like four out of the five MEV events uh, uh, side events that were hosted uh, outside of ETH Denver this time. So so we are definitely quite uh, aggressive on a lot of the MEV uh, sort of narr narrative that uh, that that we have as well. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Um, I guess like within within that kind of MEV space, like. What are some of the current trends and narratives uh, within that? I know, like this was super popular. It seemed like, uh, like in twenty eighteen, and then you know, there's yeah, all these different yeah, cycles, yeah. and then the last bull market like also got really hot again, and then calmed down. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also just I saw, I saw, is this uh, Mohammed? Um, uh, I see, I see Mohammed join. Uh, there, there is a guy who had a bunch of like small white papers who 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 hand cut into like a you know a textbook kind of stuff which was super funny anyway um uh, sorry this was a bit of a detour there uh, but yes so so uh i think uh interesting narrative that uh, i see with the um uh, mev right now there's a two conflicting sort of like ideology that i see to exist uh, in mev one is a group of people who um claim that uh uh, that uh, you know uh, that block building doesn't need to be 
uh, doesn't need to be trust minimized, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the, those censorship risk and those liveness risk is uh, is too trivial to be uh, considering the need for even an infrastructure like uh, like a Suave, uh, what what Flashbot is trying to do. So there are some groups of people who think that that is just uh, uh, you know uh, unnecessary or it's a, it's a bit of an overkill, um, and and they they, they would. I guess claim that okay, you know, the future of block building, the MEV side of stuff, should be uh, just a diverse diversification of uh, different types of services that are provided uh, by block builders, whether it be uh, block uh, customizations or uh, uh, commitment guarantees or um, sort of like MEV background guarantees, etc. Uh, right. So, so those are the services that you know they claim that those block builders should provide as a way to so like uh, diversify and differentiate their themselves uh, from the rest of the block builders to get gather order flows from the market. So that's one. But then on the other side, you have uh, you have teams like flashbots uh, or or pro pro flashbots guys who would claim that you know having uh, a decentralized or trust minimized block building uh, infrastructure is sort of like the end goal. Uh, of the uh, what uh, uh, block building should be in the future, right? And frankly, I'm I'm actually also on on that uh, on that boat as well, and that's also why I wrote up a long form report about different ways in which uh, a lot of the you know research are being done to 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 uh, build block in a decentralized uh, manner or trust minimized manner, which are quite different uh, if you look at look into the details. But but yeah, so so those are two competing narratives that I see right now. And uh, and we'll see we'll see how how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah, and it it seems like a lot of people think that like MEV is gonna go away uh, eventually, uh, <laughs> and then there's like another side is like MEV is just part of you know the process. It's there's always gonna be actors kind of playing an important role. Uh, well, other people are saying, oh, this is a little bit you know predatory to the chain. Uh, what do you what do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, my general take on this is that uh, I don't think you can uh, eliminate uh, MEV um, because uh, by by trying to eliminate it, you are uh, most likely just shifting uh, MEV problem to a different layer, uh, right? I think uh, recently Robert uh, from Flashbot has published, well, not published, but you know, uh, kind of made a comments about the first come, uh, uh, was the first, uh, what's it called? First come, first uh, serve, or like, uh, I forgot the name, but F FCFS, right? Yeah, the the basically the the sort of like the first in, and then you kind of like the first, get the first inclusion into the block, uh, in terms of like how they uh, order transactions, like that would you know eliminate uh, MEV at its base layer. But it's just gonna turn the entire sort of MEV into a, a latency latency game, which is which is gonna be very uh, sort of like anti decentralization because when it comes to latency games, it's just a matter of like how close your uh, uh, block builder is sitting next to uh, the searchers and and sitting next to the validators because that way you can reduce the latency to like nearly like zero, so so that you can have the best inclusion of transactions and hence the MEV attempt at uh, capturing those like arbitrage uh, across different orders. So so I'm I'm definitely not on the boat of like MEV like mm, protection uh, or like uh, MEV like reduction per se. Uh, however, I do think that uh, uh, there is a bit of a nuance in terms of like reducing let's say some some malicious MEV, right? Like I, I think it is fair to try to attempt uh, to reduce malicious MEV, such as like sandwich attack or some some form of like front running. Um, so so that's that's uh, that's totally fair. At its core, I believe that uh, MEV should be something that we should use uh, as an incentive to further decentralize the uh, underlying uh, uh, network. Uh, in, in the case of Ethereum, uh, we should use an MEV well to decentralize the uh, the the block uh, block sequencing uh, side of stuff, which I think is super important. 
Um, and, and that's also the one of the reasons why I believe that, uh, that the work that Flashboss guys are doing is, is very, um, uh, you know, respectable because it's, it's a very tough, tough, uh, tough, tough job that they're trying to attempt uh, right now. Yeah, uh, and I guess kind of taking the, the 30,000 foot view again a little bit, um, it seems like every, you know, the start of every bear market has its little black swan event. And I hate to mention the, the hallowed name of FTX again, but, um, you know, that was kind of the trigger for this, which brought up a lot of concerns around, you know, government regulation, um, adoption in the mainstream as well. What are some of the current bottlenecks you see to overall adoption in the industry, as well as like themes around, um, you know, things that need to be solved, such as UX issues, uh, expanding on use cases or institutional engagement? Yeah, so um, actually, I think uh, um, there's two aspects that I see right now. One is uh, uh, sort of like a cultural aspect where uh, which could be quite overlooked to to uh, in in many contexts. Like people may not consider this uh, a lot, but because like when you, when you talk about like UX and UI UX and whatnot, like yes, that is a problem. But um, for me, like the bigger issues that is often sort of like stopping people from really getting into the space is 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 kind of like the uh, the, the sort of like the uh, uh, the narrative around and, and also the culture around the uh, around the web 2 space looking into web 3 so if they see that is is like a scam kind of stuff then uh, which a lot of people still do um, then it's obviously gonna take a, a very long long time to convince them to like you know like come into crypto, for example, um, and and especially given now that the, the market is, is is kind of bearish, like that is even harder for 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 people to be uh, convinced and uh, and and join the um, uh, join the space. So so that's uh, for sure. And th- another another aspect that I see right now is also quite uh, challenging is how uh, unfriendly some of the large banks are towards crypto. So I'm not sure if you use if anyone here like used uh, uh, Bank of America before, but uh, um, it's actually quite uh, crypto unfriendly, right? Like if you, if you have like uh, money off ramp from like Kraken or or even sometimes Coinbase, like some the, the the Bank of America could sometimes just like freeze up your account and ask you to like withdraw all the money so that you can like get out of the Bank of America. Uh, I think the unfriendly uh, centralized uh, unfriendly CFI space, those banking. Uh, unfriendly crypto bank, uh, unfriendly banking system that we have right now, especially in US, is definitely hindering a lot of those uh, people to first build a trust on, uh, build a trust on crypto as a concept, and second, be able to freely move their capital uh, across from Web two into uh, Web three. Uh, so, so yeah, having a more fr- crypto friendly bank is something that I think is absolutely uh, necessary. And amid the Silvergate. Uh, uh, you know, fiasco that we that we're having right now, it will it will be interesting to see how it's going to play out for sure. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I I mean, in the U.S., what what role do you really think regulation is going to have on bringing us into like the next bull cycle? Um, are we kind of going to keep building, keep dealing with this without a lot of clarity, or you know, at least in the U.S., you, you know, where where is that kind of trending towards? Yeah, so I actually do think that regulatory clearance around uh, around crypto, or at least like uh, sort of like a positive signal from the governments towards crypto, would definitely uh, uh, be a significant enough uh, trigger to uh, uh, to even perhaps start the next uh, sort of like a bullish. Uh, bullish uh, sort of stage. I'm not sure if I can say a cycle, but you know that's something I'm kind of expecting. The reason why I said this is because we have a similar sort of like a, um, analogy playing out actually in Japan right now, uh, which is some some is, which is an emerging crypto market uh, at the moment, uh, despite the rest of the markets being super bearish. So so if you if you take a look at what Jap- Japan is going through, they are they are the first uh, uh, country to regulate crypto, uh, but uh, but they regulate it in a way that didn't make a lot of sense, right? They tax people thirty percent on unrealized uh, uh, capital gain on crypto, which was like you know what the heck, you know that's 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 crazy. But now that they have realized that the regulation was bad, they roll back on it 
and they now are becoming sort of embracing crypto as a narrative to essentially uh, bootstrap their uh, you know waning economy. And now they are trying to use Web3 as a narrative to essentially boost their entire uh, uh, Japanese economy right now. And, uh, and that is a very big catalyst for why major companies like Toyota and, and Sony and, uh, and many, many others like, you know, telecom companies are actually, you know, uh, aligning their foot with those crypto companies and, uh, and try to get into Web3, which is something that we actually don't see in U.S., uh, like, like we don't see Apple and Ford announcing their Web3 incubators with uh, crypto projects, uh, you know, uh, in the States. So, so it's a very interesting sort of like a narrative that, that I've observed that I'm hoping to perhaps see later down the road when we have a better regulatory, regulatory clearance around the, uh, around the crypto in the States as well. And, 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 and as you kind of alluded to, yes, I, I believe that it could be a, a big catalyst for, uh, for people to have a even broader sort of like adoptions of crypto later on. Yeah, that is that is a super interesting trend as well. And I, I wonder, you know, how much, it, as much as that is working in Japan now, I wonder how much that could be transferred to other countries as like Japan has a very unique kind of culture and way of, of governance uh, as compared to the U.S. where there's very, you know, you have corporate America and then there's like this kind of Web3 theme of like uh, everyone in or having a Web3 startup is very much like, anti-corporate America to some extent, it seems like, um, you know, I wonder if, if that will change or, or who, who's going to have to give first. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I would be interested to kind of see like, w- what kind of deals are you seeing uh, the most of lately? Um, you know, we, we did mention ZKs a lot. Uh, where else is there just like a high concentration of startups being created? Um. Yeah, so if you say like, okay, like um, in terms of high concentrations, uh, regardless of like actual quality of the projects, um, I would say uh, uh, one is still, uh, you see still a lot of DeFi stuff. And then another is definitely some uh, ZK stuff. Um, And I say that because there are definitely a lot of people kind of like trying to take advantage of the narratives around you know, uh, ZK and, and kind of like just build some random projects that slap on some ZK proof on top of it when it doesn't actually make much sense. Uh, and frankly, I, you know, I've seen a lot of like, um, I guess, uh, people who have a lot of, you know, BS about ZK and, 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 and kind of like try to raise a large amount of money. Uh, and, and in fact, they do actually successfully raise money because, you know, some investors may just simply uh, FOMO invest into those projects and not really look at uh, uh, what, re- what what they are really doing uh, on on uh, on the on the code base, for example. So so yeah, there are definitely a lot of uh, projects around zk DeFi, but I do also see a lot of uh, bullshit bullshit around in the space. Yeah, and I guess along with that every, you know, or I, I would assume many, many investment firms have a thesis. What would you say is the thesis of Fenbushi Capital? And how does that align with your kind of personal um, opinions in the space? Yeah, um, I think so. So uh, to, to abstract it out to an even higher level to kind of describe what Fenbushi believed to be the core thesis. Um, I think I can probably distill down to two points. Um, One is uh, a decentralization. Um, So Fembushi is actually a name that was uh, was coined by uh, Vitalik when it was founded. Um, And uh, at at its very core, we are trying to uh, invest and uh, in a project that promotes uh, decentralization. So, So that kind of like, uh, brings why we have not invested in some projects, uh, e- even though th- despite being very uh, lucrative projects uh, as an investments, uh, because uh, we do not see the sort of like the decentralization aspects uh, from from some of those like uh, projects that we see in the space. Um, obviously, I'm not going to name the name, but you know, uh, you you will you will see what I mean. 
And then another aspect that we also follow very diligently um, uh, for our investment is is the sort of like the long term value proposition of the projects. So uh, we like to we like to support projects that are uh, providing uh, a very long term values that we believe would hopefully survive uh, and and exist in the next you know five to ten ten years. Uh, we pr- we frankly do not like to see a projects that um, that are trying to do like pump and dump kind of stuff. And so 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 yeah, we we strongly adhere to our our uh, sort of uh, goal of investing in a uh, in a long term uh, value value prop uh, projects that are also defensible and uh, could be uh, sort of like the building into the cornerstone of the blockchain ecosystem. That is, uh, that is a great summation. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people in the space are, are, are saying, hey, like this is a VC coin or this is a VC project. And then they're like, they want a fair launch project. Um, but oftentimes I think that's, that's kind of a miscalculated assumption just to say like, hey, like, you know, they're not pro crypto or, or whatever. And this is not necessarily the case with one investor or, or from issue, but, you know, kind of broad concept, uh, that people hold ac- across the VC space. So I'd, I'd kind of like to hear a little bit what you think about that and, and why, um, you know, venture capital is important in the space. Yeah, yeah. So um, so that's a very interesting point, right? I think, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm going to get heat, some heat for this, but I think during the bull market, VC gets the shit for investing in a project early because uh typically that's also when they are their vesting schedule ends and that uh you know they start uh, uh uh offloading some positions um but then in the bear market uh they kind of get the sort of like the you know uh the attentions from the founders to to start raising capital and i think it's to some extent it's like i i see why that uh, that criticism is 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 the case because yeah like there there are definitely some like you know not so good actors in the VC space that are doing uh, perhaps uh, you know unfriendly stuff to the the, the the specific ecosystem that they have invested in um, and so that's that's why from our side like from Fembushi Capital perspective. We we do try to uh, maintain our uh, sort of like a project um, uh, ownership to uh, uh, a very like low degree. We don't we have a specific target where we do not want to uh, surpass. So uh, some some funds uh, of our size may have a ta- uh, ownership target where where they want to have at least own like I don't know a few percent of a certain projects. But contrary to that, we actually have a target where we do not want to surpass that ownership uh, of the projects. And then the main consideration of that is because that if we if we surpass that point, uh, we may we may uh, jeopardize the decentralization of the protocol itself. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating approach. Um, I, I'm I'm sure a very effective one. I know, I know uh, a lot of people were thinking, hey, like you know, myself included, the, all the funding is going to go away. There's not going to be any VC funding. It's all going to AI. The spare market's going to be just absolute Armageddon. But uh, the truth uh, is, as it turned out, there's a lot of active VCs, and you know, VCs are raising money from LPs at a at an active rate, and there's there's just tons of projects getting funded. Uh, so that that did not play out the way I think many of us expected. Um, you know, as we as we kind of wrap it up tonight, I have one one kind of a zinger question for you, Yuki, and that is, you you don't have a job right now, you, but you have your connections in the space, you have your knowledge, you have your skills, and you have a hundred thousand dollars. What crypto startup do you start, and why? That is a zinger question. Um, yeah. Um... So actually, uh, this might be still uh, a bit early, um, but uh, I may start building something on the 
on the MEV space, which is something that I'm very familiar with. Uh, I'm not I'm I'm not going to be building like uh, infrastructure like what what Flashball is doing, but uh, I have had some thoughts around building something uh, that is uh, sitting on on top of uh, uh, likes of MEV share and Coin Liberal and other sort of like uh, 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 MEV redistribution protocols. So so yes, uh, that's something I would probably be. Uh, digging into if 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 I'm in that situation right now. Uh, but one thing I would say though is that the, the 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 that side of the market is still quite early. So, um, you know, I'll probably starve to death. Uh, by the time it, the market is mature enough to to you know, uh, for for me to release that kind of products. Yeah, <laughs> we will have to see. But I mean, I think the the space is super interesting. Kind of as you were explaining. Um, I, I guess now we we can open it up to some audience questions and you could go ahead and, you know, add any, any points or thoughts that you had additionally. Um, but we do have one question uh, that kind of touches on this, um, which is, uh, could you elaborate on why front running is bad and non front running is okay? Oh, thank, thank you, Andrew, for the questions. Uh, so, um, in terms of why front running is bad, um, I think the the simplest answer is because you will get you will be executing your order at a price that is uh, most likely higher than uh, what you would have originally uh, executed at. So that would be kind of like uh, uh, be part of this uh, the 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 slippage uh, uh, within whatever like. Uh, Uniswap or whatever platform that you're executing at, uh, but uh, some uh, front running could cause the price uh, of your execution to uh, essentially raise uh, by a certain amount, um, and and that could be, I guess, uh, damaging one the user experience, and also uh, could could also cause the user who are originally executing the uh, the trade to lose some money, uh, whether it be a profit or or whatever, because of the price raise. Uh, due to the front running. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, thank you, thank you so much for your time um, tonight, Yuki. I guess uh, if, you know we don't have any other questions right now, but if anybody else, you know, wants to uh, join in or so you need to, if you have any other questions. Nope, uh, good to go on my end. I think if that's everything, we can probably just wrap it up here. Uh, thank you once yeah. again. Really appreciate the time and uh, really appreciate the insights as well. Hope for all of you tuning in, you uh, got, t- took something away from this valuable experience. And uh, yeah, once, like, likewise, you know, it was uh, great to have you on. Yeah, thank awesome. you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the for the questions. Thank I, you. I did have one question and, uh, if, you, if you have time. Yeah. Stay on for a sec. Yeah, hey, Jake. Hey. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, I was wondering, um, do you think that VC firms after this uh, wave will stop buying tokens uh, or and just buy the equity in the company? Or uh, do you think that, you know, token will still be a way that VCs make the investment? Yeah, so I think um, uh, my general take on this is that uh, if you if you are a truly uh, crypto native uh, venture capital firm, then um you should be trying to invest in a, a in a token regardless, um, and and the reason why for that is because uh, imagine like if you are a protocol that is one trying to decentralize and two trying to build on uh, on chain, then it would make a lot a lot of sense for you to be uh, either turning yourself into some sort of foundation or some sort of DAO eventually when you grow to a certain size, and so. In that sense, we would be still expecting um, uh, expecting like token uh, type of uh, investments, uh, not just uh, equity type of investments. And that's why, like from our perspective, we still focus on token investments, uh, despite the market is uh, not very good for uh, token. Now, another aspect set to consider is also because uh, you know token as a as a as a vehicle of uh, investment is definitely quite unique to crypto, and it's also a, a vehicle that usually um, usually outperforms uh, the equity investments in 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 many many ways. Um, so if you look at like you know like the best investments that you know uh, let's say. Fembushi did in 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 the history, you know. I don't think any any investments could have beaten 
the Ethereum investments that were made by the by the founding partner back in 2014. Um, so so if you look at that narrative, like token at the end of the day is still one of the most uh, aggressive uh, investments uh, that that uh, that a lot of VCs can make uh, to this state. And a uh, quick follow-up, do you think that that means that the token has to be uh, a financial instrument, like an equity, because then it can't really be a community benefit once the VC owns it as an equity equivalent, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it doesn't have to be like equity equivalents, uh, to be honest. I think uh, at, a, at its base, if it is just sitting at, at a city, almost like a, like a um, governance token, let's say, um, that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and frankly, if the project is is good and big enough, that uh, it will naturally create a value for the governance, uh, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people have seen with <laughs> like the Uniswap stuff was, was going on like uh, a month or two back, right? Um, so yeah, I don't think there's nothing, anything wrong with just like token without, uh, without uh, equity. Um, but But having said that, Typically, like nowadays, uh, the token and equity does come together because a lot of the founders may try to cater for so like both types of investor because some 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 you know investor who come from a bit more conservative background would be preferring like equity allocations versus token, um, and then some other ones like us may prefer like token allocations versus uh, equity. So so we kind of like you know they kind of just give both uh, just in case you know uh, to 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 have both in the in the cap table all right well thanks everybody for tuning in tonight um you know really great to have you here yuki uh we touched on a lot of amazing points it was really wide ranging um so thank you so much um feel free to uh, learn more about BAP at blockchainacceleration.org. Uh, and you can see uh, how to join as a member right on the website. Uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.